today we're studying the spirit of Elijah, spirit of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He was the forerunner of Christ. And he had a particular message. He had a particular spirit. We see that in this last message of mercy, also Christ's uh, work cleansing the temple of a sacrilegious profanation is also given to us as an example. We can study Christ's life at this point in his ministry. What was he like? Because that will give us, that will illustrate how we are to be, how, how this message is going to go. Also, we can study Elijah and John the Baptist as well to get a better understanding of how this last message of mercy is going to look. What is the spirit that's going to categorize it? We can look at Jesus' spirit when he's cleansing the temple of the sacrilegious profanation as an example of the last message that's going to be given to the world. And we can look at Elijah and John the Baptist and their spirit as an example of the spirit that's going to categorize the last message of mercy ever to be given to the world. And so we're going to do that now. So let's first start with Christ. And we're going to read the story from Desire of Ages of when he cleanses the temple. With searching glance, Christ takes in the scene before him as he stands upon the steps of the temple court. I like that with searching glance. With searching glance. It reminds me of Zephaniah chapter 1. And at that time, I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men which are settled on their lees. Those are the people that are drunk, that say in the, their heart, the Lord will not do evil, neither will he do good. So with searching glance, Christ takes in the scene before him as he stands upon the steps of the temple court. With prophetic eye, he looks into futurity and sees not only years, but centuries and ages. He sees how priests and rulers will turn the needy from their right and forbid that the gospel shall be preached to the poor. So this is given to us as an example. He's, he's seeing into the future as well. He's seeing century and ages, so he's seeing our day. All these things were written for examples upon whom the ends of the world have come. The ancient prophets wrote for more for our day than their own, so their writing is in force for us. So especially in our day, would we expect to see this type of thing taking place? And who's most at fault for the evil that's going on in the church, in the temple? The priests and rulers, leadership. He sees, what does he see when he takes in all of this, all of these future centuries? He sees priests and rulers abusing the needy. And this is what really upsets Christ. He sees how the love of God will be concealed from sinners. And men will make merchandise of his grace. As he beholds the scenes, indignation, authority, and power are expressed in his countenance. The attention of the people is attracted to him. The eyes of those engaged in their unholy traffic are riveted upon his face. They cannot withdraw their gaze. They feel that this man reads their inmost thoughts and discovers their hidden motives. Some attempt to conceal their faces as if their evil deeds were written upon their countenances to be scanned by those searching hearts. Again, Zephaniah chapter 1. And at that time, I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men which are settled on their leaves. That say in their heart, the Lord will not do evil, neither will they do good. Neither will he do good. The, the, the attention of the people is attracted to him just by a look, just by a searching glance. And they see indignation. They see great anger. They see authority. They see power in his face. The confusion is hushed. The sound of traffic and bargaining has ceased. The silence becomes painful. A sense of awe overpowers the assembly. 
it is as if they were arraigned before the tribunal of God to answer for their deeds. I want to tie this in to the investigative judgment, which is the cornerstone belief in Adventism, the sanctuary. Christ is ministrating on our behalf, and he enters into a phase of the work in 1844 at the end of the 2300 days. He moves from one compartment into the other compartment of the sanctuary. The scene is found in Daniel chapter 7. And he begins to open the books and there's a court proceeding and he's going over the records of those that have died in Christ. So he's starting, I assume, at the very beginning with Adam and he's working his way down. Eventually that would pass from the dead to the living. First, last generation. There is a last generation, Christ says, this generation shall not pass in Matthew 24. It tells us to learn the parable of the fig tree. We can unlock the meaning of the parable of the fig tree, and we can understand the prophetic events connected with that. Then we can understand what generations earth's last generation. And the judgment passes from the dead to the living. He's going to search Jerusalem with candles. And so in the last work of warning the world, it's likened, it's likened to Christ cleansing the temple of its sacrilegious profanation. But this time for us, the meaning is he's, he's cleansing us from our, our idolatry. He's cleansing us from our soul temple. He's cleansing the heart. If you read in the Desire of Ages, she gets into that parallel, how the cleansing of the temple is symbolic of, of, the, of the cleansing of the heart. And that's where we are in time. We're here at the very end of the world. Christ is even at the doors. This generation shall not pass. And he's searching Jerusalem with candles. He's cleansing his people of, of their idolatry and of their sin, of their soul temple. This is, a, this is a painful process, this rending of the heart and not of the garment. So let's continue on in this quote. The confusion is hushed. The sound of the traffic and bargaining has ceased. The silence becomes painful. A sense of awe overpowers the assembly. It is as if they are arraigned before the tribunal of God to answer for their deeds. That's where we are in the investigative judgment of the living. Looking upon Christ, they behold divinity flashed through the garb of humanity. The majesty of heaven stands as the judge will stand at the last day. Not now encircled with the glory that will then attend him, but with the same power to read the soul. The searching of the Jerusalem of God's people with a candle. Now, I'm going to go back in time to shortly after the disappointment at the beginning of the rise and progress of the third angel's message. There's a lot of fanaticism in that in those early days like there is now. So it's a good part of history to look at for guidance. They're dealing with a lot of false teachers like we are now too. And noticed how the Lord gets rid of these false teachers. It says the presence of the Lord, which was so painful to the fanatical sinners, impressed with awful solemnity, the company assembled. But after the children of darkness had gone, a sweet peace from the Lord rested upon our company. After this meeting, the false and wily professors of perfect holiness were never able to reestablish their power over our brethren. It reminds me of the, the temple cleansing to uh, Christ drives out the money changers. He drives out the rabbis, the Pharisees. And then there was a new class that came to him, children, the, the needy. They gathered around him, and it was really a beautiful moment after that. But it was, it was preceded by a moment that was awful in its solemnity and that was very painful to the sinners. And it was the presence of the Lord that was painful to them. This was also the case when he's driving out 
those that are bargaining and turning God's grace into merchandise, the silence became painful. And there was a sense of awe that overpowered the assembly. The, the company that was assembled were impressed with the awful solemnity of the moment. His eye, continuing in the story of the sacrilegious profanation, his eye sweeps over the multitude, taking in every individual. His form seems to rise above them in commanding dignity, and a divine light illuminates his countenance. He speaks in his clear, ringing voice, the same that upon Mount Sinai proclaimed the law that priests and rulers are transgressing, it is heard echoing through the arches of the temple. Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Slowly descending the steps and raising the scourge of cords gathered up on entering the enclosure, he bids the bargaining company depart from the precincts of the temple. With a zeal and severity, he has never before yes. manifest. One thing that's fascinating about this quote is the comparison that's made. It's really a very sublime scene where the same voice that was ringing out in this temple was the one that was heard on Mount Sinai that proclaimed the law that the priests and rulers are transgressing. I don't have any, I don't have anything to elaborate on that. It just kind of hushes me up and puts me in silence just reading about that. Very solemn, and a lot to take in, a lot to consider there. Even if you were righteous, it would cause you to tremble just to be a part of these scenes. Slowly descending the steps and raising the scourge of cords gathered up on entering the enclosure, he bids the bargaining company depart from the precincts of the temple. So he's telling him to leave. You have to go. What comparison could we make in our, our our day, well, we, like Elijah, we we need to tell the the, the false prophets to go. We need, like uh, John the Baptist, who, when the rabbis were approaching him, he's doing baptisms, he's preaching in the wilderness. They're approaching him, and they would come, uh, many of them, and he was not fearful to reprimand them. And say that they are a den of vipers and they need to repent for their sins, that they are vipers and they need to repent. And so Christ also is saying, get these things hence. And he's saying, leave the temple. With a zeal and severity he has never before manifested, he overthrows the tables of the money changers. The coin falls ringing sharply upon the marble pavement. None presume to question his authority. None dare stop to gather up their ill-gotten gains. Jesus does not smite them with the whip of cords, but in his hand, that simple score seems terrible as a flaming sword. He doesn't even need to use it. He just holds it there. Officers of the temple, speculating priests, brokers, and cattle traders with their sheep and oxen rushed from the place with the one thought of escaping from the condemnation of his presence. They're, they were truly, truly terrified. This was the scariest experience of their life. What's comical about the whole thing, if that's the right word, is that they say to themselves afterwards, we'll never allow this carpenter to do that to us again. And if you think about it, there were centurions there, armed guards. I don't think, I think these priests are, are generally pretty tall men of, of, of large stature. So I don't, I don't think they're wimpy, strong and intimidating in their own right. 
but the Lord by himself was able to scare all these grown men and have them running. And they were terrified. And he has this whip and he's flipping their tables over. He's not tipping them over. He is flipping them over. He's overthrowing them. There's nothing soft or tender or gentle or feminine about what he's doing. This is intense. A panic sweeps over the multitude who feel the overshadowing of his divinity. Cries of terror escape from hundreds of blanched lips. Even the disciples tremble. They are awestruck by the words and manner of Jesus, so unlike his usual demeanor. In Exodus, it talks about how the how our God is a God of war and killing and judging in this way, executing judgment in this way, this punitive judgment it is a, a strange act for the Lord. It is a strange act for the Lord, but there are occasions which warrant this strong behavior where it's justified, where it's righteous. This is a righteous indignation that we're reading about. And this is, again, a spirit or the spirit, the quintessential spirit that characterizes the last work to be given to the world, the loud crime message, calling sin by its right name laying out uh, the sins of Babylon being laid open, cry, crying with a strong voice that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and that to come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. The seven last plagues are coming. Christ is coming back soon. And it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's a consuming fire. And the elements are even going to melt. If you're going to give that message, and you're going to give that message, and it's going to, and in a powerful way that that where the people are going to be spellbound, it has to be characterized correctly. The intensity of the judgments they need to be felt and realized. So it has to be given with zeal and force of character. Okay, continuing in the quote. They remember that it is written of him, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Soon the tumultuous throng with their merchandise are far removed from the temple of the Lord. The courts are free from unholy traffic, and a deep silence and solemnity settles upon the scene of confusion. The presence of the Lord that of old sanctified the mount has now made sacred the temple reared in his honor. I'm jumping a few paragraphs here, but still in the same chapter. Overpowered with terror, the priests and rulers had fled from the temple court and from the searching glance that read their hearts. And at this time, I will search Jerusalem with candles. And their flight they met others on their way to the temple and bade them turn back, telling them what they had seen and heard. Christ looked upon the fleeing men with yearning pity for their fear and their ignorance of what constituted true worship. In this scene, he saw symbolize the dispersion of the whole Jewish nation for their wickedness and impenitence. That was the scene of Christ cleansing the temple of its sacrilegious profanation. So let's build upon that. Let's look at Elijah now. Let's, let's look at his work and what his ministry was like. So again, that scene in Christ's ministry is typical. It typifies the last work to warn the world, but also Elijah typifies that last work, that last warning message, Revelation 18 message, the fall of Babylon message. And so we're going to look at Elijah now. 
you see similarities. The work of Elisha as a prophet was in some respects very different from that of Elijah. To Elijah had been committed messages of condemnation and judgment. His was the voice of fearless reproof, calling king and people to turn from their evil ways. Sounds like Christ when he cleansed the temple of its sacrilegious profanation. Elisha's was a more peaceful mission. His it was to build up and strengthen the work that Elijah had begun to teach the people the way of the Lord. Inspiration pictures him as coming into personal touch with the people, surrounded by the sons of the prophets, bringing by his miracles and his ministry healing and rejoicing. So Elisha's, Elijah's successor, Elisha's ministry was a peaceful ministry. It was building up. It was strengthening the work. Elijah's was very different. His message was condemnation and judgment. His was fearless reproof, calling king and people to turn from their evil ways. And Elijah even executed the prophets of Baal. He seized them and he destroyed them. So we have condemnation, we have judgment, we have uh, destruction. With Elisha, we have peace, we have building up, we have strengthening. Now, at the end of the world, does it say, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, I will send you Elisha, the prophet? No, it says, I will send you Elijah, the prophet. And that makes sense because what we're doing is we're calling out the sins of Babylon. We're saying Babylon is going to be destroyed, come out of her, plagues are coming. The Lord is coming soon. The battle of Armageddon is soon to ensue. The four winds are about to be released. Those are wars and, 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 and uh, revolutions. And the islands of the sea are going to be swallowed up and hail is going to fall down to the earth. And the nations are going to battle in the Valley of Jehoshaphat and destroy each other. And we even see the beginnings of that now. The nations are angry. So it makes sense that Elijah is the prophet that God chose to be a symbol for our work at the end of the world. I want to show you something, though. Elijah wasn't a weak man by any means. Elijah was a man of mild and kindly spirit, but and that's very Christ-like, but there's a but here, but that he could also be stern is shown by his course when, on the way to Bethel, he was mocked by ungodly youth who had come out of the city. These youth had heard of Elijah's ascension, and they made this solemn event the subject of their jeers, saying to Elisha, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. At the sound of their mocking words, the prophet turned back, and under the inspiration of the Almighty, he pronounced, he pronounced a curse upon them. The awful judgment that followed was of God. There came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two of them. That's gruesome. That's very gruesome. So we, we can see here that that sternness, that fearlessness, there's a big group, big group of of young men, 42. It was a fearless thing to pronounce this judgment against them. And he did this. And so he also had this, this strength of character too. Uh, but again, his, his work, he lived in a different age where it was time to build up. So he's working on building up the school. And I, I imagine that that was a really enjoyable project uh, to be a part of. So that's, that's, that's good for him and those that were part of his ministry. For us, Elijah is the, is the prophet that symbolizes our work and the spirit that's going to accompany this last message of mercy ever to be given to the world. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Now, 
Christ says, if you can hear it, and I know that we can, John the Baptist was Elijah. So at the first coming of Christ, at the first advent, we have an Elijah. And at the second advent, we have an Elijah. Christ declared John the Baptist to be one of the greatest of the prophets. And he showed his hearers that they had had sufficient evidence that John was a messenger from God. The words of the preacher in the wilderness were with power. So this is the evidence here. He bore his message unflinchingly, rebuking the sins of priests and rulers. Hey, remember at the, remember at the very opening quote, why, what causes Christ to become so angry, filled with so much righteous indignation? Well, the priests and the rulers were oppressing the poor, oppressing those in need, oppressing those concerned with their salvation. And that's when we see this side of Christ that's very unusual. And he's flipping tables and he's driving them out of the temple. He's rebuking their sins. And that's what we see of John the Baptist too. He bore his message unflinchingly, rebuking the sins of priests and rulers and enjoining upon them the works of the kingdom of heaven. He pointed out to them their sinful disregard of their father's authority and refusing to do the work appointed them. He made no compromise with sin, and many were turned from their unrighteousness. So this is an Elijah-type spirit, and this is the spirit that's going to uh, categorize our work. We've had the third angel's message. We see the rise and progress of it shortly after the great disappointment. In 1848, they started to publish, and they started to go forth. They started to educate. We built schools. We built sanitariums. Uh, our pioneers wrote many wonderful uh, books, and they were and they were building. They were building up the work, building up the work, and we're so thankful and grateful for all that they all that they did. As we move into the very last scenes of the great controversy, there's a there's a spirit that char characterizes the work, and it's this Elijah spirit that comes in. This is something that we haven't seen in Adventism, in, in my humble opinion, since William Miller. Since William Miller. And his associates, William Miller, he would hold crowds as if spellbound. He would handle universalists with gloves of steel, it said. And he had powerful admonitions to the wicked and to those that were not prepared to see the soon coming of the Lord. Um, he was the chosen one for his generation. And he was doing this Elijah uh, type of work. And we, this is how we need to be. We first need to make no compromise with sin ourselves. And I and I know for sure, the better we are at this, and insofar that we do this, that we repent of our sins and we pray for the Holy Spirit, we'll, we'll be given a greater measure of this Spirit, and we'll be more unflinching. Uh, we'll be more true to duty. We'll call sin by its right name, and we'll be very useful in the Lord's work. Whether it be, we won't be intimidated. Whether it be friends, family, uh, whatever, we'll be willing to make those sacrifices and, and say what we need to say for the advancement of the cause. So continuing, continuing now. The truth that is hid from the worldly wise and prudent is revealed to the childlike and humble. It calls for self-sacrifice. It has battles to fight and victories to win. At the offset, it advocate, its advocates are few. By the great men of the world and by the world-conforming church, they are opposed and despised. See John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, standing alone to rebuke the pride and formalism of the Jewish nation. This is another great example of why John the Baptist is said to be Elijah and said to have that same spirit. When Elijah stood there before the congregation, 
at the famous showdown, there was not one person in the congregation that had the strength of character, that had the will to show their allegiance to Jehovah. This spirit of Elijah is a spirit where that you can go up against the whole world as one person, that you can stand true with your God. And that's my prayer for all of us, that we would, that we would take hold of this Elijah spirit, the spirit that activated John the Baptist. This is who we're supposed to be at the end of the world. We're forerunners of Christ. The world conforming churches, they are going to oppose this work. They do oppose this work. They, com they completely despise this work. The great men of the world don't see value in it. So God's going to give us the strength of character. He's going to give the humble the ability to give this message. In every generation, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin, both in the world and in the church. But the people desire smooth things spoken to them, and the pure, unvarnished truth is not acceptable. Many reformers, in entering upon their work, determined to exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. They hoped, by the example of a pure Christian life, to lead the people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But the Spirit of God came upon them as it came upon Elijah, moving him to rebuke the sins of a wicked king and an apostate people that could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible, doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. They were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatened souls. The words which the Lord gave them, they uttered, fearless of consequences, and the people were compelled to hear the warning. This attitude, this spirit, is still very much present with us now. If you call sin by its right name, if you're very straightforward, if you rebuke the ungodliness in the church, and it's greater than it's ever been. It's greater than it's ever been. Um, we are Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet there's, yet everybody wants to put on the brakes. We want to exercise great prudence. We say things like we need to exercise patience and love and pray for the other person. By doing that, they'll eventually turn around. But eventually the spirit of Elijah comes on. We become sober-minded. And we move to rebuke these sins, just like Elijah did. Um, he did it against the wicked king. He did it against the apostate people. And that is what's going to grab their attention. And we have to do this because the Lord is coming soon. He's even at the door. We don't have time. We are running out of time. Time is against us. The hour is very late. And so we are compelled. We are, it says that we are impelled to zealously declare the truth. They were impelled, we will be impelled. We will be impelled to ze zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatens souls. Probation is closing, human probation is closing. The enemies of God are on the march. Satan just wants us to slumber on just a little more, and he knows he has us. We are a hair's breadth away from eternal damnation, so we have to wake up. It's, it's that realization, it's the truthfulness of that statement that gets us to wake up. Here's the story of Elijah. Let's just read this, and then, we'll, and then we will uh, finish uh, up today. Unashamed, unterrified, the prophet stands before the multitude, fully aware of his commission to execute the divine command. His countenance is lighted with an awful solemnity. This is Elijah. This is his countenance. Remember in the, the cleansing of the temple, the sacrilegious profanation, it was Christ's countenance that they saw that brought them terror. 
Elijah's countenance is lighted with an awful solemnity, an anxious expectancy. The people wait for him to speak. Looking first upon the broken down altar of Jehovah and then upon the multitude, Elijah cries out in clear trumpet-like tones, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. This anxious expectancy, this sounds very painful. He says, are you with God? Or are you with Baal? Is it any different in our day? Was the church then more sinful than it is now? I'd say no. I'd say the apostasy is greater. So the teachers and leaders, they're no different than Baal worshipers. But many in the congregation, they idolize them. But we have to, are we going to choose God? Are we going to choose Baal? What happens next in the story? The people answered him, not a word. Not one in that vast assembly dare reveal loyalty to, Je to Jehovah. Like a dark cloud, deception and blindness had overspread Israel. Not all at once had this fatal apostasy closed about them. But gradually, as from time to time, they had failed to heed the words of warning and reproof that the Lord sent them. Each departure from right doing, each refusal to repent, had deepened their guilt and driven them farther from heaven. And now, in this crisis, they persisted in refusing to take their stand for God. And that's where this is the exact state of Adventism right now. Is the people, they don't want to show their loyalty to Jehovah. Their loyalty is to the teachers and the rulers, to these false prophets. And so that is where we're going to end today.